Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rajesh Shah. I'm a systems engineer for Just Tech. Welcome to this webinar on email encryption in Office 365 with a concentration on OME, which is Office Message Encryption presented by Just Tech. I'd like to thank my colleague, Joseph Mello, our resident technical guru and our director of engineering who will be joining me on this webinar. I'd like to start with uh, a little bit of information about Just Tech. So Just Tech is a technology firm that started out in 2015 that is dedicated to the specialized IT needs of legal services providers nationwide. Our services include, but are not limited to IT management, planning, and strategy. Preliminary IT assessments, evaluations, and recommendations, cloud-based IT services, like Microsoft Azure and Office 365, case and matter management system design, implementation, training, and support. Our website is https www.just-tech.com if you'd like more information about our company, some of the services that we offer, or just in general, if you want to navigate our website, please feel free to go to the link below. All right, let's get started and look at our agenda for the webinar. In order to talk about email encryption in Office 365, it's good to build a foundation on the subject matter that we'll cover here. So I'd like to start with a brief description of email, what is it, and how it gets from its sender to its recipient. We will then move on to talking about the biggest cyber, cyber threats for email, which has made it imperative to have several means of data protection including systems like spam and email, fil email filters, antivirus, anti-malware solutions, different forms of encryption methodologies, and end-user education on best practices with email. We will then take a look at a brief history of encryption and the current types in use today, primarily symmetric and asymmetric encryption, on which different encryption methodologies are built upon. From there, we move on to Office 365 and the encryption methods used within Office 365 to encrypt data files and your emails, which can either be at rest or in transit. Last, we delve into an example of a specific type of encryption method native to Office 365 and do a walkthrough of an example of a user experience when drafting an email using Microsoft Outlook. We then will end with a quick Q&A session for any questions that you may have about the webinar. So email, what is it? Email is short for electronic mail. It is defined as a message that may contain attachments which are distributed by electronic means from one computer user to one or more recipients via a public or a private network. A public network could be the internet, the private network could be your local area connection that is behind the security perimeter, like a firewall. In layman's terms, instead of using pen and paper, we compose a message in a mail client on the device of our choice. The process is much quicker and much more efficient than the traditional postal service. When email was first developed, sometime around 1971, its sole purpose was to send a single line of text from one location to another without much or frankly, any concern for security. Email today has evolved considerably and has become a core day-to-day -day application for businesses. We rely on it extensively for our communications and sharing of data via attachments, in some cases, extremely sensitive data, thus making email security an essential need for every business. Now that we have an understanding of what email is, Let's take a look at how it gets from the sender to the recipient. In this diagram, we will illustrate how email flows from its origin to its destination. An individual using a device of their choice composes a message, which is usually done in an email client like Microsoft Outlook, Apple Mail, or in a web browser for internet email services like Gmail or Yahoo. Once the message is composed and sent, it hits your mail server. 
Your mail server then formats or packages the email to be transmitted over the internet using a standard called SMTP or, single, or simple mail transfer protocol. The sender's mail server looks up the at domain.com portion of the recipient's email address in a domain name system server to determine which destination mail server, also referred to as a mail exchanger, it should contact to deliver the message over the internet. Once that has been established, the email is sent over the internet. I'd like to elaborate a little bit on this process. An email address consists of two parts, a local part and a domain part, separated by the at symbol. In our example, the user is the local part. User is the actual account that we're sending it to. Test.com is the domain part. The domain part is all that is needed to know to work out via DNS lookup where an email needs to be sent to. The local part is used by the recipient's mail server to work out what to do with the email once it is received by it. The DNS server in this case is like a phone book. It maintains a directory of domain names and translates them to IP addresses, which is what is used to get from one place to another on the internet. An example of that would be gmail.com, which is very easy for human beings to remember. But if I told you to remember 172.217.10.37 for Gmail, most people would have no idea. And this is where DNS makes our lives a lot easier. Once the location of the receiving mail server is determined, the sending and receiving servers communicate using the aforementioned SMTP protocol. The receiving server accepts the message and verifies that the actual user account or the local part in the email address has a mailbox on its server. If so, it delivers the mail to the recipient. The recipient's email client retrieves the message using standards like Post Office Protocol or POP or Internet Message Access Protocol, IMAP, to download the messages to the client. The key here is when email traverses the internet bubble, it is prone to all types of cyber attacks. We have no control or visibility as to what routers the email passed through on its way to the destination servers. During this process, email can be intercepted, read, altered, or potentially deleted thus making encryption along with other safety protections necessary for emails. My colleague Joseph will now talk to you over the next few slides on the threat of cyber attacks and emails, on cyber attacks on emails, and the benefits and challenges of encryption. Joseph? Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Joseph Mello, and let me just apologize in advance. Uh, I've been feeling sick the past few days because I have a son in pre-K who brings home more than just macaroni art. Um, <clears throat> so cyber attacks. Uh, as mentioned earlier, email was not designed with security in mind. For decades, email has been the predominant end user network application. So it should be no surprise that attackers have focused their attention on exploiting email security threats. I, uh, it, this, it, pro <clears throat> excuse me, it provides a mechanism capable of placing almost any kind of threat in front of almost any target. Today's email threats can fall under three general categories. Uh, some of these I'm sure you, you know and familiar with. Uh, whatever since email applications began to include attachments, they have been used to deliver malware. And a good example of malware is known as ransomware, which is perhaps one of today's greatest email security threats. Once you're infected, it's designed to deny access to your computer or files until a ransom is paid. And you might have seen news reports on businesses, government agencies, and hospitals being hit with ransomware. Phishing emails is the practice of attackers pretending to be a trusted entity, like a friend or a coworker in a business in an effort to convince the victim to perform some action. Ordinary phishing campaigns spread emails to a broad spectrum of potential targets in order to harvest user credentials. And they're usually, generally a panic email, like quick, something's gonna happen, your account's gonna be locked out, uh, or we're closing your bank account. You have to do these steps and log in, provide your credentials so that we can continue. It's a very good scare tactic. 
Spoofing is a common tactic attackers use on email as well. Uh, the spoofed email is a message which is trying to fool the recipient into believing that the email originated from a known address. For example, the attacker may send a message that appears to have originated from your employer or a bank or another trusted source. When it comes to email protection though, systems do exist that can scan your emails and check for some of those examples above. Some may do a better job than others, but it's really a cat and mouse game where attacks keep evolving and email protections have to evolve with them. And then there are users who have to remain vigilant since malicious emails may slip through the cracks. Being able to identify that the domain name does not match the domain name you know. It could be misspelled or off by a character. You know, email encryption is not a panacea. It's not designed to fix all of the inherent flaws with email, but it does address certain weaknesses. Uh, Raj, can you move to the next slide? So what is encryption? Encryption is the process of converting information or data into code, especially to prevent unauthorized access. An early form of encryption was used by Julius Caesar when communicating with his generals. For example, using the alphabet, the letter A was written as the letter D by shifting positions like three letters down. A simple sentence would look like gibberish if you didn't understand the pattern. Encryption requires the use of a key to encode or decode data. An encryption key is typically a long random string of bits and are created with algorithms designed to ensure that each key is unique and unpredictable. Today's encryption requires the use of a program or some form of authentication. There are two prevalent encryption methods called symmetric and asymmetric encryption, which we'll discuss later and show examples of in upcoming slides. Uh, next slide, please, Rush. So, what are the benefits of email encryption? A lot of information is sent over emails and a good deal of that data may be private and sensitive. And privacy is important. If I wanna send you an email and I only want you to be able to read it, then I need encryption. With smartphones and other mobile devices gaining popularity in recent years, many companies have struggled to find a solution for keeping data stored and passed through these devices safely. Luckily, data encryption software will allow you to ensure that all data across any device is completely encrypted with the same protections in place that you would find on your desktop computer. One of the most vulnerable aspects of data emerges during the transport process. Should your encrypted email be snooped while in transit, the only thing they'll see is gibberish. The encryption keeps your data safe from alterations as well, and recipients of the data will be able to see if it's been tampered with. This is helpful when it comes to spam and spoofed emails. Alteration of data is something that many businesses often overlook when they're looking into ways to keep their data safe. And finally, compliance is extremely important, and many organizations have to comply with legal, insurance, and industry restrictions on how data can be handled and transmitted. Encryption provides one of the safest ways for your business to transmit and store data and comply with the restrictions that your business currently has in place or may have in place, like FIPS, HIPAA, or PCI. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So, there are some challenges involved with encryption. There may be issues with deciding what data should be encrypted defining what is sensitive information. And this can be solved with some thought, some organizational policies, some user training and awareness, but ideally with an encryption solution that has a set of rules to encrypt emails for you, which can take the guesswork out of it. Some encryption methods may involve a few extra steps, such as having to exchange encryption keys, which we'll talk about later, uh, with your intended recipient. They need your key and you need theirs in order to send encrypted emails to each other. And that's just with one recipient. If you have another person you wanna send encrypted emails to, then you need their key and so on. As you guessed it, there is the management of all these keys. The more people you exchange encrypted emails with, the more keys you'll add to your collection. 
And if they change their keys for whatever reason, then you'll need to update what you have for them. <clears throat> There's also a human element to all of this. These extra steps have caused people to shy away from it. The process of getting started with encryption may mean getting your own set of keys, like registration or authenticating yourself to prove who you are. Then you have to configure your email program, like Outlook, to use those keys, which may mean digging into your settings uh, and into the menu options to apply the key that you have. <clears throat> it can be confusing. And once it's all in place, there's also having to remember to encrypt sensitive emails, which could be checking a box or clicking on a button. It's easy to send an email without encryption. And we do it every day, and we're very used to it. All right, so now I've been talking about encryption keys this past slide, and so it'd be helpful if we explained a little bit more by what we mean when we say encryption keys. Uh, Raj, that's up to you now. Thank you, Joseph. I appreciate you taking the time to join me on this webinar, and I hope you and the kids feel a lot better. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so uh, Joseph talked about encryption. There's two major encryption types that exist. It's symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric encryption is an encryption type that uses a single key to encrypt and decrypt data. It is the oldest and most well-known technique for encryption. The secret key can be a word, it could be a passphrase, a number, or a very long string of characters, which is generally what's used now. And it's applied to a message along with the, encrypt, along with the encryption algorithm. Asymmetric encryption is a form of encryption where keys come in pairs for a user. Every user needs a public and a private key. The, the keys are linked, but just because you know someone's public key does not mean that you're able to decipher their private key. Let's take a look at both these uh, types in an example. Here we have two individuals. Bob and Alice. Bob and Alice want to communicate. Bob wants to send Alice an encrypted message. He starts by composing the message in his mail client, and then with the help of an encryption program and a key that's been generated, he encrypts the email and he sends it over to Alice. Alice gets the locked file but she has no way to unlock it right now because she needs the secret key that Bob has generated. The issue now becomes, how do you get the key to Alice? If you risk sending it by email, it can be intercepted and hence compromised for this email plus any other future emails that have been created using that key. Can you encrypt that key and send that message? Sure, but then again, you, what do you do with the encrypted key? You have to send that as well. So this process just doesn't really work for email encryption. Now, having said that, symmetric encryption does exist and is applied in many places in technology. But for email encryption, the solution was asymmetric encryption. Here's an example of asymmetric encryption. Bob and Alice would like to communicate again, and Bob would like to send an email to Alice. This time, Bob, with the aid of an encryption program, and Alex's, Alice's public key, which he's aware of, encrypts his message and sends it over to Alice. Alice is then able to decrypt it using her private key. Keep in mind, you can share public keys and it's irrelevant if other people have access to your public keys because your private key is confidential and secure and that is what's needed to decrypt the message. So to reiterate, public keys can encrypt the data, but only the corresponding private key can decode it. I came across a mailbox analogy that I think we're, that works very well to describe asymmetric encryption. Let's take account of a mailbox on the street. The mailbox is exposed to anyone who knows the location. We can say the location of the mailbox is completely public. Anyone who knows the address can go in and drop a letter. However, only the owner of the mailbox has a key to unlock it and read the messages inside. In terms of that analogy, the mailbox address is the public key and the physical key to open the mailbox is the private key. Okay. Now that we've covered um, 
encryption types, let's move on to looking at scenarios on when we would use email encryption. I'm sure everyone can come up with a host of reasons to use email encryption, but I have listed five here that that pretty much show um, good, to, good reason to use them. A bank sending a credit card statement to customers. There's a lot of sensitive information when a bank is actually sending credit card statements. You have your account numbers, you have your balances, you have your debit and credits, you have your personal information about your home, your residence, your name, and perhaps some other data as well. I don't know about everyone, but I use paperless communications with my bank. So all my stuff comes over emails and I feel very comfortable knowing that there's encryption being applied when this, mess, uh, when this data is being sent over to me. Another example is a doctor's office sending medical records to patients. In addition to um, ethical obligations to keep that data private, there are also HIPAA laws which require us to use encryption between the two uh, parties communicating. A third scenario is attorneys and clients sending confidential or legal information to another courthouse or attorney or a client. Same as a doctor, you would have ethical laws that basically obligate you to keep the person's information private. You could be working on a trust, you could be working on a real estate deal, people could be going through divorces. There's a lot of personal information that's been exchanged from attorneys to clients that needs to be kept private and you're liable to keep that data as secure as possible. Another scenario could be uh, where a company is working with a client and they've recently done an assessment for the client. And the client is very happy with the assessment and wants to move forward with the contract. So the manager sets up a contract and he wants the contract to be reviewed by one of the employees at the company, but they want to restrict what can be done with that contract. That contract can't be downloaded, printed or forwarded. That's another scenario where email encryption is critical. And then last, a secure communication with a government agency. I have previously worked with generic pharma companies and any communication that's being done from the company to the FDA has to be encrypted and digitally signed for the FDA to approve it or accept it. That's the uh, scenario where you would use that. Let's take a quick look at Office 365. So what exactly is Office 365? Office 365 is Microsoft's cloud-based subscription service for its suite of products, which was launched in 2011. It gives you access to a host of applications, depending on your subscription and license type. Out of the many products that are provided, but not limited to just these three, are the Office Suite, which is includes Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, Access. Uh, there's SharePoint, which is a cloud-based repository for your files and allows live collaboration on them. And OneDrive, personal and business, which is cloud storage for your files that allow you to access your files anywhere and from any device where you have an internet connection so you don't need a VPN connection or you don't need to carry a USB drive with your files on it. Office 365 uses native encryption methods. And the four that I'm gonna talk about are listed here. They're OME, SMIME, IRM, and TLS. OME stands for Office Message Encryption. It's built on a service called Azure Rights Management, which is an inherent data protection technology within Office 365. The way it works is your administrator sets up a transport rule that defines the policy that is required for encryption. As a user, when you comply with this policy, your message is encrypted and sent to the recipient. You are allowed to send encrypted emails to people inside and outside your organization, regardless of the destination email address. That means you don't have to be on an Office 365 account. You could be using third-party email providers like Gmail or Yahoo, or you can even send it to people that are hosting their own mail servers. Once the email is encrypted and sent and received by the recipient, the recipient has three options to access the encrypted message. They can use an Office 365 account, 
If they don't have one, they can create a Microsoft account, which is done for free. And you can associate that with a Gmail or a Yahoo account if needed. Or if you don't have, if you don't want to do that option as well, you can generate a one-time passcode, which is actually sent to the email that you can apply to view the encrypted email. The great part about this is the recipient does not need an Office 365 account. They can actually reply to the email and continue an encrypted thread. When the recipient receives the email, it's in a format that ends in HTML. HTML is a format that can be viewed by any browser and no special client or additional software is needed to view it. You can customize your uh, message by using your company's logo or colors, if you like, for branding purposes. Encryption is done on the cloud Microsoft servers. So in terms of the keys, they're stored on the cloud and users don't have to worry about managing the keys locally. When do we recommend using encryption methods? Based on the scenarios that I gave you previously, communications between banks and clients, doctors and patients, and attorneys and clients are ideal scenarios for OME. In terms of licensing, people need an office enterprise E3 license to use OME because it's built on Azure rights management. And anything higher than E3 will work as well. The next encryption method that we're going to look at is SMIME, which stands for Secure Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions. SMIME is a certificate-based encryption that allows you to encrypt and digitally sign your emails. It's a peer-to-peer -peer or end-to-end -end encryption, meaning it's encrypted on the sender's machine and decrypted on the recipient's machine, as opposed to being done on the servers. There is no visibility at all. Even when your mail hits the mail servers, it's completely scrambled. So no one has access to it. A digital signature helps the recipient validate the identity of the sender, of the sender this is accomplished via a digital certificate that contains the keys for verifying digital signatures and encrypting or decrypting messages. When should you use SMIME? When you communicate with government organizations that require you to encrypt your message and verify yourself as a, um, as a sender. This requires an E1 or Enterprise One license in Office 365 to set up. There may be an additional cost to using this encryption methodology, and that would be to purchase a digital certificate from a third party CA or a certificate authority, kind of like GoDaddy, VeriSign, or Komodo. The third encryption methodology we're gonna talk about is IRM, which is Information Rights Management. It's also built on the Azure Rights Management Service, and it applies usage restrictions to email messages, meaning users are restricted from printing, forwarding, or copying the message or any attachments within the message by unauthorized people. For example, if I want to send a message, an attachment, and I want to restrict people from printing it, when they get the message and they go ahead and try to decrypt it, they'll be able to do it, they'll be able to download the message too and store it on their hard drives, but the restriction of printing will still follow them there. They won't be able to print that message, despite the fact that it's off the servers and downloaded and stored locally. Users have the ability, once the uh, IRM policies are set up on the back end, to apply these policies or protection rules to the messages and attachments. They can dictate if they want to use all three restrictions or one or just two that's granular for the users. There are some restrictions to IRM. It's a technology that's still being caught up by a lot of, in, a lot of uh, different devices and applications. So there are some cases where some applications may not support IRM emails. I don't have a comprehensive list of those applications or devices, but that's something I can definitely research and let you know if you have questions about that later. The last thing we're going to talk about is TLS, Transport Layer Security. 
this isn't an encryption email encryption methodology, but it's a type of encryption that is used by Microsoft 365 natively to encrypt the connections from a client's device to the server as the email is going, as the email is traversing to the server or between two servers. Okay, so how is email encrypted in Office 365? So when a message is composed, it's encrypted or transformed from plain text to unreadable ciphertext on a central server in the case of OME or IRM. In the case of SMIME, the actual encryption is taking place on the client's machine. Remember, it's an end-to-end -end or peer-to-peer -peer encryption method. While the message is in transit, it's also using TLS as a second layer of security to protect the messages from being read or altered in case they're intercepted. Once it hits the recipient, the message is transformed back into readable text in one of two ways. If it's done on the client's machine, it's the same as mine. And if it's done on uh, the central server for the recipient, it's either done through OME and IRM. So now I want to focus on looking at an encryption example using office message encryption. In this case, I have opened up my default web client, which is Outlook, Microsoft Outlook. I compose a message like I would do normally. On the back end, my network administrator has set up a transport rule, which basically states you have to use the word encrypt or encrypted in the subject line of the email for the email to be encrypted. So I'm sending over a family recipe for like awesome and chutney, and I'm sending it to a person that's not on Office 365. It's on gmail.com. And I use the word encrypt, and I put in my subject, and I put in my contents, and I go ahead and hit send. Once I hit send, the person that has Gmail opens up their Gmail account, and they get a message that looks similar to this. The very top has the subject line, including the word the very top has a subject line. The body of the message basically said you've received an encrypted message from your sender. To view your message, save and open the attachment, which is at the bottom, message.html, and follow the instructions for signing in using the recipient's email address. There's a little padlock at the bottom of uh, that that tells you that this message has been encrypted by Office 365, and the actual message contents is in this link. Please note that the email actually is received by the recipient, but the contents of what was written in that email are not downloaded to your email client. They are still residing on the server in Microsoft's cloud. So I go ahead and click on the message.html link, and it brings me to this page. It tells you that you have an encrypted message, it tells you who it's from and who it's addressed to, and it gives you two options, an option to sign in or use a one-time passcode. And again, at the bottom, there's a padlock that tells you the message has been encrypted by Microsoft Office 365. In this case, I have three options that I mentioned you can use to log in. You can sign in and use a free Microsoft account, and you can have that link to your Gmail or your Yahoo account, or AOL, if even some of you still have that. Or you can use your Microsoft 365 account, or you could use a one-time passcode. In this case, since the email was addressed to my Gmail account, and I have already linked my Gmail account to a Microsoft Office, uh, Microsoft account, I'm going to go ahead and click Sign In. When I hit Sign In, I get this little window for, um, from Microsoft that gives me the address that it's addressed to, and it prompts me for a password. The password is the one that I've used to link to my Microsoft account. And I have to go ahead and hit, put in that password and hit sign in. When I hit sign in, it takes me to this page, which tells me it's an encrypted message, and it actually opens up the contents of the message would now reside on the server and allow me to view it. I have the option now to just accept the email or I can reply to the email. If I continue the email thread 
and I choose to reply to it because I'm missing some information or I'm looking for more information, the email chain continues to stay encrypted despite the fact that I don't have a Microsoft 365 account. So I can go ahead and hit reply. When I hit reply, it sends the message back to the sender and the sender receives a message that looks like this. You have an encrypted message from, some, uh, from the recipient's account to the sender's account and you have the same options to sign in or use a one-time passcode. In this case, I don't want to use my sign-in to Office 365, so I've decided to use a one-time passcode. Please note the padlock is still at the bottom and it shows message encryption by Office 365. So when I click on the one-time passcode option, it sends me a message to my email address and it will prompt me with a one-time passcode. And it gives me 15 minutes to enter that one-time passcode in here. I have an option to say this is a private computer and keep me signed in for 12 hours. You can go ahead and do that if you like, but I don't recommend it. It's just an extra layer of security. So I get the email from Microsoft and it looks like this. It basically comes from Microsoft 3, Office 365, messaging at microsoft.com. It has the branding for Office 365. It generates this one-time passcode and it tells me that I need to enter this into the previous screen that I had, which is here. So I go ahead and take that. I will enter that into the one-time passcode. And once you have the one-time passcode, you can hit continue. And you should be able to see your emails that you have. And you can either continue the chain or you can end it there if you like. And that's an example of OME, Office Message Encryption. I usually get frequently asked questions, and these are some of the main questions that we get. Email encryption will not occur without the following words in the subject line. Those words are not set to encrypt or encrypted. It's set to whatever your network admin sets for you. Any misspellings or other forms of the word will not encrypt the message. So in my case, I have to use encrypt or encrypted. If I actually typed in encryption in the subject line, it would not encrypt the message. Email encryption protects you from your emails being intercepted, but it does not protect you from sending your emails to the wrong person. If you encrypt your message and send it to the wrong recipient, that is a user error. That is not going to be addressed by email encryption. You can protect yourself by starting an encrypted email chain with someone to confirm that it's the right user prior to sending your actual contents. External recipients that do not have a subscription to Microsoft Office 365 can read, view, and reply your messages in an encrypted form. You can also access your encrypted uh, emails on mobile devices by downloading OME viewer apps for iOS and Android. They're on the place in the Google Play Store and in the App Store for Apple. I have some helpful links here if people would like to do some further reading. Uh, the first link is for email encryption in Office 365. It generally talks about um, the different methodologies for email encryption. The second one looks specifically at uh, the example that we looked at, which is Outlook message encryption. And then the third one is uh, general encryption in Office 365 on how it works for on more of a technological um, form. So I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, joining our webinar. I think we are a little bit earlier early. Uh, Joseph, would you like to add anything that I've missed in the presentation? Yeah, I could add that. Uh, so Office 365 is constantly updating their platform <clears throat> in various ways. And so the example of like, say, uh, setting up a mail rule that says use the word encrypt or encrypted, that's just one way that you can use as an admin to set up uh, encryption in your environment to, to try to make it easy for users to use. But there's other ways that you could set it up. Microsoft has recently, a few months ago, added the capability for you to sort of set up rules that say, if you're going to email this specific person, then always encrypt your email. 
Uh, and so the, the mail room, the transport rule is basically going to recognize you're sending an email to this this individual, which is part of a rule that you've created, and so that, that email will be encrypted. Uh, and then you could mess around with sort of the way you want to set up those rules. Um, I think uh, I don't think that link was uh, was added into the slide, so I could um, I could pass that on to SART so that it could be included. Um, but yeah, so there's there's different ways that you can do it, and then you know there's also the possibility that you know later Microsoft will add further capabilities and tying more things like the information rights management into it, which uh, which Raj kind of talked about earlier, which is the ability to sort of protect. Uh, contents or data sort of being downloaded or printed or forwarded out to other individuals because you want to have that that kind of control uh, so that people could just view the content of the data but not sort of pass it around to someone you did not authorize should be able to view that content. Uh, but that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Um, so both Joseph and I have our information on here. If everyone like anyone, anyone would like to reach out to us, feel free to email us for any questions that you may have. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for um, attending this webinar and uh, hope it was informative. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions at this point. Does um, anyone have any questions? Uh, the only question that we received online was, um, can we get a copy of the slide presentation? Uh, there was a lot of useful information in there. Um, we're definitely happy to distribute that. Um, uh, otherwise, like. Thank you. This was very comprehensive. I, I think the uh, basic intro foundation uh, really helped a lot before diving into the more technical stuff. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. So I guess yeah. uh, we're, we still have 16 minutes, or um, are, are um, we ready to end? We've covered all, all of the content. Um, uh, happy to end early at, at this point. I would like to remind individuals that we have two more webinars coming up. Um, they are December 4th and December 5th. Um, one is on user rights uh, management and security. Um, the other is on help desk management. I uh, definitely recommend people checking those out. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel here within the next week or so. Um, we will be updating our website. Uh, probably about a week after that with all of our recent uh, trainings on um, our website, but they're all currently also up on our YouTube channel. Um, as a reminder, LSC is going to be taking over the LSM TAP uh, program here near the end of the year. It will be continuing next year, and you will probably see a survey uh, very soon that asks people what types of trainings they would like to see for next year. Uh, the training series, it sounds like, will be continuing on. There's also a conference coming up. Um, the Innovations in Technology Conference is coming up in January in Portland. I look forward to seeing individuals out there. Uh, it's my home city, so I will definitely be there. Uh, thank you guys so much from Just Tech and coming out here and uh, putting this training together for us. Sure. Well, thank you very Sorry, much. Just, uh, just to throw this in, I uh, I got the links from directly from Microsoft on how to set up um, encryption and sort of defining those mail rules, which I added into our chat, but it's only for organizers and panelists. I was wondering if you could okay. copy and paste that for everyone. I will distribute that out to everyone here in the chat. Um, right. <clears throat> for all the uh, IT administrators who are itching to get this uh, in place. Excellent. Now, I, I look forward to these practices becoming um, the standard in the industry. I think there's, there's so much more that legal um, can really learn from what has happened in health and in banking um, to really up the level of security that is available for our clients. Absolutely, I agree on that. Uh, excellent. Um, you all have a wonderful afternoon. And um, I encourage people that have further questions over this to uh, reach out to our panelists. Also, join the LS Tech uh, email list. There is a, a Google form on the front page of lsntap.org that lets people get directly added to that. But we've got about 800 people who deal with these uh, issues on a daily basis that can answer questions and share best practices there. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.